and you shall hear of wars and rumours of wars, see that you be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. All these things are the beginning of sorrows. And that quote from Matthew certainly rings relevant to us here in 2021, doesn't it? Even if you're only paying a cursory attention to the news, both at home and more further afield, you'll be able to link things that you've heard and seen to most all of the events Christ references in that prophetic statement in Matthew. All across the world right now, we're witnessing an all-encompassing all rather disease pandemic a disaster of unparalleled proportion and catastrophic significance. We're seeing increased competition amongst the nations for power, influence, resources and territory. Competition that involves nations both great and small right across the world. We're seeing and hearing about wars both hot and cold, out in the open and buried deep in the shadows, nation rising against nation, natural disasters of various terrible natures occurring with greater and greater frequency and greater and greater intensity, afflicting the lives of millions. And even in the midst of our own comparatively low-key COVID experience here in Australia, it's easy for us to lose sight of these things by getting caught up and blinkered in our own experiences. But we need to step back and look at the bigger picture. We need to be watchful. We need to think about these things and how they relate to scripture to keep ourselves awake to the fact that, as I said, we, whilst we might feel like we're in a bit of a limbo land right now and under virtual house arrest, feeling like we're not really getting anywhere in life, God is still at work and his, the cogs of the wheels of that greater design of his are still turning and will one day soon remake the world and bring humanity back into harmony with himself. So the game plan tonight, we're going to touch briefly on Afghanistan and the significance of the death throes of that sorry episode. We'll look at wildfires in Greece, Siberia, Israel and elsewhere, earthquakes in Haiti, war-induced famine in Africa. We'll look at COVID and the role the pandemic is playing in reshaping the world into one that resembles that which will exist at the time of our Lord's returning. We'll look at the unholy trinity of Russia, Turkey and Iran, the nations of Gog, Togama and Persia, as referenced in Ezekiel 38, we've just read. The key players and their current activities as they relate to prophecy as we understand it. We'll look at the fading light of the Western rules-based global system headed by Britain and America, one that, especially after the recent humiliations of Afghanistan and the Trump presidency, looks to be increasingly fragile and under threat by the will and the ways of other less principled actors. And lastly, we'll look at Israel herself, albeit briefly. We'll look at her current condition, her activities, and the threats to her as they stand and as they relate to the events of the apocalypse and Christ's return. So as I'm racing the clock, we'll dive right in and look at the first of our talking points, Afghanistan, a paradox in being both a medieval backwater and centre of the world's attentions all at the same time. Seemingly unimportant, but also a place that has become renowned as the graveyard of great empires. Geopolitically, Afghanistan is strategically important. It's landlocked and hemmed in on all sides by bigger, more advanced neighbours. She shares borders with three former Soviet states, Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan and Tajikistan, as well as the giants that are China, Pakistan and Iran. She is mountainous, stark and full of natural beauty. A lot of mineral riches lie untapped beneath the ground and she's populated by a diverse and largely tribal ethnic population, Pashtus, Uzbeks, Hindus, Muslims, Christians and others, peoples deeply divided and yet 
often united in their visceral hatred of external interference and stoically resistant in the face of foreign occupation. Over the last few hundred years, great empire after great empire has tried and failed to tame Afghanistan, only to come away wounded in a lasting and consequential way from the experience. The first ones to try were the British in their imperial prime as rulers of neighbouring India and Pakistan, and most recently in concert with the United States after 9-11. They've been into Afghanistan and failed no less than four times in 200 years. The Soviet Union went into Afghanistan in the late 1970s in support of a communist coup, only to leave nine years later with their tails between their legs and their great power prestige in tatters defeated at the time by US-sponsored Mujahideen guerrillas, an eclectic band of tribal insurgents and religious zealots that during the subsequent years up to 9-11 would give rise to the Taliban and Osama bin Laden. The events from September 11 onwards we're all pretty familiar with, so I won't talk about that so much. Um, suffice it to say that once again, all of the will all of the blood, treasure and prestige thrown at this place by the great powers has turned to ash in their mouths. The Taliban, who we once thought defeated and irrelevant, are back bigger and better than ever in one of the most momentous comebacks since Michael Jordan's return to the Chicago Bulls. Women, children, Christians and everyday Afghanis that were complicit with the American-led mission and the now defunct internationally-backed government are in grave danger of persecution, suppression and deadly reprisal. And America and Britain's prestige and influence as leaders of the free world, defenders of democracy, protectors of the Western rules-based global system, is largely in tatters. Criticisms of America and Britain come now from both without and from within. Here's just a few headlines from the last few days. US loses moral credibility abandoning Afghan forces. That's from the Chinese Global Times, a newspaper that's renowned as being a mouthpiece of the Communist Party. Six decades after Suez, says the Times newspaper in London, we, that is Britain, remain impotent in the face of US policy. Whilst the New York Times has to say, Biden rattles the United Kingdom with his Afghanistan policy. The geopolitical implications of the Afghanistan pullout is something we'll touch more on later, but the failure that has been most rudely exposed in recent days is best summed up in a proverb that's been attributed to the Mujahideen and their descendants since the 1980s and the Soviet occupation. You, that is the West, may have the watches, but we have the time. Wars and rumours of wars, famines, pestilences, earthquakes in diverse places. So what of those natural disasters? Well, in the last six months alone, we've seen a bevy of significant and tragic natural happenings afflicting many parts of the world. Since Christmas, we've seen rampant wildfires in Turkey, Greece, Siberia in particular, covering an area greater than the wildfires in the rest of the world combined and in the mountains of Israel, just outside Jerusalem. Floods in Germany and Turkey have killed hundreds in recent days, and there have been devastating earthquakes both in Haiti and in the Philippines. Here in Australia, we've seen the worst mouse plague in generations wipe out whole crops overnight and infest large parts of our regions, ruining livelihoods, and putting a severe dampener on what would have otherwise been the best harvest in a decade. The Caribbean nations are again at the mercy of another massive hurricane. And in Africa, war-induced famine in Ethiopia, the Congo and Mali, along with other ra racial, religious and ethnically motivated atrocities across that troubled continent are once again upending the lives of thousands. Wars and rumours of wars, famines, pestilences, earthquakes in diverse places. And all of this before we talk about COVID. 
This scourge has proven to be one of the most consequential events to afflict humanity in more than a century. Outside of the two world wars, nothing of such far-reaching consequences happened on this scale since 1918 at the beginning of the Spanish flu pandemic. Just for context, the Spanish flu over two and a half to three years infected over 500 million persons and killed over 50 million worldwide. That's those we know of. COVID in a similar time, 100 years later, has thus far infected over 209 million and killed nearly 5 million. Although I would caveat that by saying that most epidemiologists talked to, um, who publish their thoughts consider these numbers to be massively optimistic and the deaths in particular to be chronically underreported. The times we're living in right now are proving to be ones of massive international upheaval. New words and phrases are entering our common vernacular on an almost weekly basis. We've only got to think of things that turn up on our news feeds every day. Contact tracing, social distancing, herd immunity, PPE, super spreader, travel bubbler, Zoom, just to name a few. Along with mainstream life in general, our ecclesial life has been turned upside down and our faithful associations have been severely impacted and our confidence challenged. Nothing and nobody seems to be immune from this new reality. People across the world are fearful, confused, feeling isolated, frustrated and angry. And I'm sure we can think of several places in scripture where that kind of behaviour or experience is, is referred to in a prophetic way. But amongst all these emotions and feelings, brothers and sisters, we can be hopeful. We can look to scripture and find both understanding and comfort. Throughout the scriptures, we have evidence of God using both disease and plague to bring about his will and levy his judgments. The plagues in Egypt at the time of the captivity are a classic example. Despite mankind's delusions, God is in control. Throughout history and into the future, such significant events will continue to challenge humanity because of our ongoing disobedience and rampant godlessness. We look back again to Matthew 24 and the parallel account in Luke 21. Wars, famines, pestilences, earthquakes in diverse places. Those things Christ spoke of in the Olivet Prophecy, we understand, don't we, to have a twofold fulfilment. One, we believe, has already come to pass in the turmoil of AD 70 and the destruction of Jerusalem, the dispersion of the Jewish community to the four corners of the world. The second is yet to come, the increasing unrest and turmoil that will reach its climax at the coming of Christ and Armageddon. And just as God's judgments were wrought in this way in biblical times, so too will they be again in times soon to come and possibly even in times we're experiencing right now. In Ezekiel 38, as we've read tonight, we see prophecy foretelling of the severity of God's judgments against the nations at the time that Gog and his alliance come down from the north. The thing we perhaps need to think about, acknowledging that we can never really be certain about events serving as prophetic fulfilment until after the fact, is whether or not we can afford to ignore things happening at our present moment because the beginnings of the birth pains, the beginnings of sorrows that Christ talked about at Olivet have to have their advent at some point. And who are we to say that that's not right now? Christians are out of favour or in grave peril across the world. Anti-Semitism is again on the rise. Nations are in turmoil. Disease and natural disaster are upending the lives of millions in a steadily increasing crescendo. Are we watching? Are we ready? COVID is not just upending everything we've taken for granted for so long and come to understand and expect to be normal. It is serving to accelerate significant changes in the global balance of power and upending the geopolitical status quo something of which we have to be really mindful as it affects both our future here in Australia and the future of our hope. 
The globalised, rules-based international system made possible and regulated by the post-World War II Pax Americana, as it's popularly referred to, or that is American dominance and peace secured by American power, is coming under increasing threat by other less principled players, namely Russia, China, Iran, North Korea, Turkey and others, who seek to supplant and subvert American power and dominance and are moving amidst the confusion and uncertainty of COVID to gain that power, that influence and position, whilst America and the rest of the free West in general is weakened and otherwise occupied. However, the pandemic has also awoken many in the West to our over-dependence on China economically for so many of those modern conveniences and necessities that we take for granted. And the level of strategic impotence that that imposes when things go a bit pear-shaped. The West is now slowly and belatedly moving to address this threat to its fundamental interests and its sovereignty. As the pandemic begins to be brought under control, Western and unaligned nations are taking steps to diversify their trading relationships, re-establish sovereign industrial and manufacturing abilities, and think a little freely in ways that will allow them to escape from any future beholdenment to China. They're also quickly expanding and recapitalizing their militaries in acknowledgement that they have hidden beneath the shelter of America's strong arm for far too long, and that events of recent times, like the turmoil of the Trump presidency and Biden's precipitous withdrawal from Afghanistan, show that America can't always be counted on to think outside of her own parochial interests to act in the greater good. And we'll cover that situation a bit more soon. Two out of those three nations I mentioned as seeking to capitalise on America's mistakes and waning power are significant to us because we understand them to have a great and terrible role to play in the bringing about of Armageddon and the events, the events rather, surrounding the return of Christ. Ezekiel 38 verse 1 to 6 introduces the alliance of nations that will one day invade the land of Israel. The prophecy introduces the leader of these nations as one called Gog. The names of those nations he co-opts to assist him in his mission are also revealed. And if we read these verses and look at a map detailing where these places and peoples are, we can see a coherent image start to come together. Those verses read, the word of the Lord came to me, son of man, set your face toward Gog of the land of Mago, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, and prophesy against him and say, thus says the Lord God, behold, I am against you, O Gog, chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, and I will turn you about and put hooks into your jaws and will bring you out and all your army, horses and horsemen, all of them clothed in full armour, a great host all of them with buckler and shield wielding swords. Persia, Ethiopia and Libya are with them, all of them with shield and helmet. Goma and all his hordes, Beth Togama from the uttermost parts of the north with all his hordes. Many peoples are with you. And on the slide on your screens, you can see the modern identities and place names listed in, the verse, uh, listed in those verses in the table on the left versus the geographic spread of those ancient kingdoms on the right, the red being those that will stand against Israel, the blue that will stand with her. The king of the heap, of course, is Gog, also titled Prince of Rosh, Meshach and Tubal. Rosh is, of course, Russia, Magog, the lands of Eastern Europe, Meshach and Tubal, the geographic and ethnic heartland of the Russia that we know today. Lands and peoples that have their earliest mention back in Genesis 10, when those lands are settled by the descendants of Noah's third son, Japheth. Gog, otherwise, uh, not, Gog's other title, rather, that we recognise from scripture, is the king of the north, as characterised in Daniel 11 a passage that is very much in parallel and complementary, rather, to the one found in Ezekiel 38. At the time of the end, says Daniel 11, verse 40, shall the king of the south push at him 
and the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind with chariots and horsemen and with many ships. And he shall enter into the countries and shall overflow and shall pass over. In Daniel 8, it tells us that this king of the north will be a ruler of fierce countenance, understanding dark sentences. His power shall be mighty. This description is expanded on in Revelation 16, where it tells us that one of the three unclean spirits like frogs will come from the mouth of a dragon. We associate this dragon with Daniel's king of the north because if we look at history and indeed the present day, we see that the dragon is a consistent heraldic symbol throughout history. Firstly, in the military of ancient Rome, then in the Byzantine and Eastern Roman Empire, which rose from Rome's ashes, and as well in today's contemporary Russian state. Further justification of this can be found in the fact that today's Eastern Orthodox Church, which fled to Moscow on the fall of Constantinople to the Arabs in 1453, boastfully refers to itself as the Third Rome. The current leader in Moscow, as he has been for the last 21 years and will be well into the future thanks to recent constitutional changes, is President Vladimir Putin. Since taking charge in 1999, Putin has led Russia on a dangerous path towards a gradual renaissance and return to great power status, much of which has been pursued in contravention to the dominant global conventions and power balance instead of in league with them. He's famous for being an ex-KGB intelligence operative and former head of the Russian FSB or Foreign Security Service, as well as publicly lamenting the collapse of the Soviet Union as a great national tragedy. He's considered by many to be the world's richest man, almost all of it ill-begotten, some 200 billion US dollars at last estimate, and has repeatedly shown a pattern of deception followed by military action to create a fait accompli in order to achieve his territorial or political and economic aims. We only need to think of Russian actions in Georgia and Kosovo, Ukraine and the Crimea, Syria, Libya and Iraq to see evidence of this duplicitous and opportunistic pattern of behaviour. He is not averse to using threats, underhanded tactics like disinformation campaigns, social media bots and cybercrime, as well as bellicose displays of military might in order to get his way. In recent times, he has become increasingly belligerent and sought regularly to test the will and tolerance of the West, as well as to interpose himself into international affairs where he senses American or Western weakness something he is already trying again in the wake of the US pullout from Afghanistan. Russian state media was quick to crow a few days ago to anyone that would listen that Russia's was the only international embassy in Kabul that was still operating as normal during and after the Taliban takeover and that it had every intent of remaining so. The irony of this, given the tragic Soviet history in Afghanistan, is pretty extraordinary. These actions and behaviours fit very well with the almost Machiavellian description of the King of the North that we find in Daniel chapter 8, reading from verse 23. And in the latter time of their kingdom, when the transgressors are come to the full, a king of fierce countenance and understanding dark sentences will come up. And his power shall be mighty, but not by his own power. And he shall destroy wonderfully and shall prosper and practice and shall destroy the mighty and the holy people. And through his policy he shall cause craft to prosper in his hand and he shall magnify himself in his heart and by peace shall destroy many. He shall also stand up against the prince of princes, but he shall be broken without hand. Please note the sub points that I've put up put up on the slide there, which are taken from the New New Living Translation as against the main translation of the King James. It's interesting in helping to understand what's 
being said in that slightly cryptic language. He's a king of fierce countenance. He understands dark sentences or, as the New Living Translation puts it, he's a master of intrigue. That seems to fit, doesn't it? His power shall be mighty. Well, yes. He will destroy wonderfully or cause great destruction. He's shown very well that he's willing and able to do that. He will prosper. Russia, despite the West's sanctions, is doing pretty well. He shall cause craft to prosper in his hand. The New Living Translation puts that he will be a master of deception. Again, very apt. He shall magnify himself. In other words, he shall be arrogant and haughty. His power will be mighty, but not by his own power. I think that's reference to the fact that he does a lot of things underhand and with a level of what the uh, journalists and politicians would call plausible deniability. So it's not obviously him, but it is him. And by peace, he will destroy many. In other words, he will destroy many without warning. By guile and by cajoling, he will pull the wool over people's eyes until it's too late. I could say a lot more about Putin's Russia and her activities that play towards the development of that nation into the gog that we recognise in scripture, but there's not enough time for that tonight, so I would strongly encourage you to go and look at more of that yourself. Russia is also in the process of building strong relationships with Turkey and Iran two countries that feature in scripture as members of the Gogian Alliance under the ancient names of Togama and Persia. Iran's antipathy to Israel is well understood and we'll touch more on that soon, but Turkey's is a more recent invention. Under their current president, Recep Tayyip Erdogan, Turkey has taken a path away from a secular system of government and a clear separation of church and state towards an Islamic dominated state. He has sought to re-establish its position as a regional power and has grown its relationships with both Russia and Iran, simultaneously devaluing those that it has held for a long time with the United States and its fellow NATO allies, as well as with Israel. It's clashed with America over the handling of the intervention in Syria and US support for the Kurdish ethnic minority that Turkey views as terrorists. It continues in its long-held antipathy to its neighbour Greece and this has only been amplified by the recent discovery and attempted exploitation of large natural gas reserves on the seafloor of the Eastern Mediterranean. Greece, Turkey, Egypt, Cyprus and Israel all have their own substantial claims to this undersea bounty, and it's likely to prove to be a point of significant regional tension well into the future as those nations compete over conflicting claims and over future customers for their product. The natural gas boom is also a primary driver behind substantial military expansion and a burgeoning regional arms race, particularly expansion of those respective countries' navies in order to guard their oil wells, gas wells and territorial waters. Israel's natural gas finds in the Leviathan field off northern Israel and Lebanon and oil deposits buried deep beneath the Golan Heights will certainly be part of that great spoil sought by Gog and her host when she comes south across the mountains of Israel in conquest, bringing with her, as mentioned in scripture, many ships. Iran also continues in its long-held antipathy to Israel, openly sponsoring anti-Semitic activity and directly manipulating terrorist proxy groups like Hamas in Gaza and Hezbollah in Lebanon. The regime has recently inaugurated a new prime minister, Ebrahim Raisi, a wanted international terrorist and hardline disciple of the current supreme leader, Ayatollah Ali Khamenei. This appointment of a fundamentalist zealot over other more moderate candidates has been seen by many as a sign of impatience with the West and a reaction to growing internal discontent and protests against the West's crippling sanctions after reintroduced by President Trump after he reneged on Obama's Iran nuclear deal. With President Trump gone, Iran has been emboldened to resume playing a careful but dangerous game. One of the original 
architects of that first nuclear deal, Joe Biden, is now president and back in the Oval Office. And Iran needs a reintroduction and renegotiation of the deal in order to lift those crippling sanctions and stave off major internal unrest. At the same time, however, it's moving strongly to take advantage of the near failed state in Lebanon and seize quasi control through its Hezbollah proxy. In addition, it's sponsoring the Houthi rebels in Yemen and engaging in a tit for tat series of attacks on Israeli interests after Israel began attacking targets in Syria and elsewhere, it thought linked to Iran's support for Hezbollah and the continuance of Iran's nuclear program and long held desire to develop their own nuclear bomb. The latest of these attacks was a suicide drone strike on an Israeli cargo ship in the Persian Gulf, resulting in the deaths of four people, including two British nationals. Iran is also thought to be indirectly supporting the Taliban in Afghanistan and has sought to gain influence by power and power by proxy in Syria, Libya, Iraq and Yemen. It's a near certainty that at some point in the near future, either Israel or Iran will overstep and the resulting open war could well be a trigger for Russo-Turkish intervention in the region. Vladimir Putin is considered a trusted friend of Israel at present and is known to have long held personal Jewish sympathies. But this contrasts to historical and contemporary anti-Semitic activity in Russia as a whole and to the knowledge that we have through scripture, particularly from Ezekiel 38 that we've read tonight, that something will occur to change his mind and one day set him against Israel. I will turn thee back, says Ezekiel 38, verse 4. I will put hooks in thy jaws. I will bring thee forth all thine army, horses and horsemen. It's clear from the language that permeates Ezekiel 38 that God, much like he was with the Egyptians, the Assyrians, the Babylonians and the Romans, is the guiding hand that creates the circumstances under which Gog thinks an evil thought, as Ezekiel 38 says in verse 10 and 11, and is drawn to come against Israel if, as if led by hooks in his jaws. Okay, to quickly cover the Western powers and longtime guarantors of Israeli security, Britain and America, before we finish up looking at Israel herself, and I'm very quickly running out of time. As we've already seen, America's power and influence is on the wane, and the country is challenged by both rising international and domestic concerns. It's a country that's deeply divided at home. This has been seen most recently in the turmoil surrounding the Trump presidency, the Black Lives Matter movement, the response to COVID, and the massive ideological and policy differences between the left and right of politics in America. She's also shifting her attentions necessarily away from the Middle East and the long war against terror towards the growing threat of China's rise in the Pacific, leaving a vacuum in the Middle East and Europe that others will be all too keen to fill. Traditionally pro-Israel, recently in America, domestic force support for Israel has waned as evidenced by scenes of protests against the Israeli bombing of Palestinian civilian areas and the destruction of property during the latest violence in Gaza. The Democratic Party is increasingly beholden to the ideological left of American politics, stacked with people who are neo-Marxist or postmodernist in their attitudes to social justice, the environment and foreign policy, positions and attitudes that are degrading US influence and prestige abroad, isolating and alienating long-held friends and emboldening potential enemies. These new generation Democrats are largely secular, minority group sympathisers who delight in identity politics, are generally against US foreign interventions and see Palestinian statehood as a right and compromise with Iran as essential to the avoidance of war. Whilst President Biden is nominally pro-Israel, he's also one of the key authors of the original Iranian nuclear deal and will take a far harder line with Israel than the permissive stance that we've come to expect from his predecessor, Donald Trump. Should Israel do anything rash in defence of its interests, it's easy to see a situation where Biden's America might choose to limit its support or threaten to withhold it altogether pending progress towards a two-state resolution of the Palestinian question. Lately, Following the damage done during Trump's presidency and most recently following Biden's withdrawal from Afghanistan, 
America has lost a lot of international prestige and respect, has been deeply distracted by the tumultuous conditions at home, which stem from the hyperpolarized political environment, accusations of political and big business corruption, growing wealth inequality, the spiraling debt crisis, racism and woke culture versus the radical right, America is basically a powder keg waiting to be spiked off. It brings strong recollections of that verse in scripture about the sea and the waves roaring. It will be very interesting to see how this affects American foreign policy and the future state of relations between America and Europe. As we know, at some point in the future, Europe has to take a hard swing away from America towards the arms of Russia, as many European nations will follow Russia into Israel being the contemporary descendants of Magog and Goma, as we read about in Ezekiel 38. The 2020 edition of the Milestones Prophecy magazine by Brother Don Pierce covers this situation in far greater depth than I will be able to tonight, and I would recommend it to all of you if you haven't read it already. I would also recommend the series of talks given at the recent Prophecy Special Effort in Adelaide for more information on this and the influence of the Pope and the Catholic Church on the situation. As I mentioned earlier, Australia and Britain can be counted amongst the nations who are making changes in policy to chart a more independent and sovereign course in light of both the rise of China and Russia on one hand and increasing American unpredictability on the other. For the first time in decades, Britain is again establishing a permanent royal naval presence east of Suez, that is to say in our part of the world. And the recent redeployment of her new aircraft carrier, HMS Queen Elizabeth, to the South China Sea shows that she is intent on maintaining and extending her international presence and ability to project diplomatic and military influence in defence of her national concerns, independent of America if need be. She is also reaching out in a post-Brexit world to re-establish and extend old associations long neglected. Australia, India, Canada, New Zealand, Japan and Western friendly Arab states in the Gulf are but a few of the players with which we can expect to see Britain reconnect and collaborate with in far greater degrees in the times ahead. There are moves currently to re-establish an economic and mutual defence union between English speaking members of the Commonwealth, which has been given the acronym CANZUK, that is Canada, Australia, New Zealand and the United Kingdom. Whether this union will come into being or is Uncertain at the moment, but these things remind us of prophecies in Ezekiel 38 in particular regarding the end times. Verse 13 says, Sheba and Dedan and the merchants of Tarshish and all its leaders will say to you, that is Gog, have you come to seize a spoil? Have you assembled your hosts to carry off plunder, to carry away silver and gold, to take away livestock and goods, to seize a great spoil? Britain has traditionally been seen by us Christadelphians, particularly the prophecy junkies amongst us, as the historical Tarshish. And by extension, her young lions have understood to be those nations of like language and culture that came from her imperial past. Canada, Australia, New Zealand, India to a lesser degree, as well as America and those nations that today occupy the Arabian Peninsula and North Africa that used to be British colonies or protectorates. Oman, Yemen, the United Arab Emirates, Bahrain, Saudi Arabia and Sudan. We know these places as the, they are the sites of the biblical kingdoms of Sheba and Dedan spoken of in Ezekiel 38. Christadelphians have long understood this to mean that at some time before Armageddon, Britain and her allies in the Anglosphere will be in a position to, quite possibly in the post-American world, have the confidence to speak out in their own interests and in the interests of Israel as an economic, political and military alliance. It will also be an alliance that is capable of independent action, quite possibly bereft of American leadership that has been seen as a prerequisite before now. The current British Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, and his leadership seem keen to re-establish a strong international image and presence. They're investing in new relationships and like many of us have been caught off guard by America's abrupt and ill-considered exit from Afghanistan. Professor Michael Clark, a fellow of the Royal United Services Institute, which is a British military and foreign policy think tank, 
was quoted recently as saying, as a result of the tragedy of in Afghanistan, Western democracies will take a big credibility hit in the eyes of the autocracies and the uncommitted of the world. It may result in more challenges to the status quo as the West's adversaries test her resolve and the ability of America to uphold its values when its own hard interests are not directly in question. It's not difficult to envisage circumstances in areas such as Southeast Europe, the Mediterranean, East Africa or the South China Sea where new challenges may arise. If and when that begins to happen, policymakers across London will have to take another hard look at their capabilities and the real politic of the situation and decide just how much global Britain can exercise independent influence at a strategic level. Recent history in Iraq, Syria, Libya, and now Afghanistan indicates that the going is getting tougher for Western democracies as they try to maintain the liberal democratic status quo. The United Kingdom has been involved in all of these struggles, but its relative inability to make a strategic difference to any of them should, after the anger, guilt, cynicism and weasel words, be something that the policy establishment might reflect on more honestly. And the professor's thoughts are typical of the thoughts of many at present as Britain struggles to see a path forward and decide who and what she is and who she is capable of becoming. Many are looking with excitement to news that Britain has concluded a mutual defence cooperation agreement with Israel. At present, this seems to be limited to some kind of terms of reference for high-level discussions between leaderships, as well as a bit of technology sharing, but it may extend further in the future. Most of Boris Johnson's current cabinet are all pro-Israel, and the current chief of staff of his cabinet and his Israeli ambassador are both Jewish, so who knows on that score. Lastly, and quickly, to Israel herself. Israel at one time is doing amazingly well, but also has had a pretty troubled last 18 months with COVID, the latest round of violence in Gaza, and the political instability there resulting in mo multiple rerun elections to try and break the impasse, not finally being resolved until a few months back. This transition saw the replacement of longtime Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu with his hardline successor and rampant Zionist Naftali Bennett, a one-time protege of Netanyahu who has now helped bring together a centre-right coalition to form a government that includes both ultra-Orthodox Jews on one hand and Israeli Arabs on the other. How this new government will deal with the international community and in particular with issues such as the ongoing proxy war with Iran and settlement construction in the West Bank is yet to be seen. But the early read is that Bennett's administration will be far more self-assured and willing to act independently of the blessing of the international community, something that we've already flagged tonight when it comes to actions against Iran and Biden's desire to restore the nuclear deal. The other major change has, of course, been President Trump's so-called Abraham Accords that have normalised relations between Israel and several formerly adversarial Arab states in the Gulf and elsewhere. So far, Bahrain, the United Arab Emirates, Bhutan, the Sudan and Morocco have signed normalisation agreements with Israel that allow economic, political, tourism and military cooperation. This is a powerful sign to us as we know that there will be Arab nations in the region of Sheba and Dedan that side with Israel at Armageddon and that the coming of those times, in the coming of those times rather, Israel will be dwelling self-assured in a state of prosperity and relative security, a sense of security that will someday soon prove to be ill-placed. As far as the fulfilment of that prophecy is concerned, even when we contain our references to Ezekiel 38 alone, we can see that many things have happened and many things are still to come to pass. The peoples, God's peoples rather, have returned to the mountains of Israel they have gathered there out of many nations. They have been brought to the desolate land and restored it to production. They have inhabited a land once desolate. The nation now is a desirable spoil. They have cattle and goods. She dwells in the midst of her promised land. She is friends with the merchants of Tarshish and her young lions, and she occupies the land of Israel. 
And to this list in 2020 and 2021, we can add that she is friendly with the nations of Sheba and Dedan. Brothers and sisters, it's all coming together and we neglect our awareness of this to our peril. I won't spend any more time on this tonight. I'll leave it here, but it's important for us in light of our hope to, to be aware of all this stuff, to keep our ears to the ground and our eyes on the horizon. For we know that the movements of the nations and changing global attitudes are things that whilst troubling, we can take hope and strength from. The days are quickly flying and we need to ensure that when Christ does return, we aren't caught napping like the sleeping virgins with their lamps untrimmed unaware and unprepared for the redemption that will soon be upon us. So please watch the news, depressing though it can sometimes be. Look up the recent Prophecy Day talks on YouTube or get Uncle Steve Dodson to send you the Dropbox link. Get your hands on the latest copy of the Milestones magazine and search out anything you've heard tonight that you wish to examine further or clarify. Thanks and God bless.